All right, and we're live. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the podcast. Matt from The Status Quo. Matt, how are you? Pretty good, man. How about you? Excellent, excellent. Thanks for having me. Yeah, all the honor's all mine, as always. Um, so our last conversation, we kind of talked about the the differences and similarities between constitutional conservatism and anarchism. And I learned a lot from talking with you um, as someone who's kind of knowledgeable about this stuff. And, you know, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we kind of came to the conclusion there's more similarities than there are differences. And that I liked how you phrased it, that we're, you know, we're all looking to ride this liberty train. And, you know, we might get off at different stops, but at least we'll be in a better position working together than, than you know, being divided and letting, uh, you know, the, the, the left get their way. In this case, you know, the, the advancement of socialism and, you know, stronger centralized government. Your thoughts? Yes, ab- absolutely, man. That's the one thing that the left has going forward is that they don't really get into internal divisions. They're not as fractious as I think the right is in a large part. And also, you see this thing, man, where it just kind of frustrates me, right? Because as far as culturally goes, I'm kind of right of center. And I see the right in today's America always playing defense, just constantly defending against whatever the left is doing, essentially. That's that that's not a winning strategy mm-hmm. because if you if you're in a boxing match right and you just you're just blocking and parrying punches all the time like you're going to get knocked out eventually. Mm-hmm. So yeah, absolutely, I agree entirely, and we definitely. I mean, it's so funny because from my perspective, I think making the case for liberty is always going to be better and more convincing than the case for tyranny. But you have to make the case in the first place, <laughs> right? And uh, the problem with Nobody ever comes out and makes the case for tyranny. They always dress it up in uh, things like, oh, we need better regulation or we have to make sure people have universal health coverage. And it's, you know, man, it really is a wolf in sheep's clothing. And you're so correct on that because, and actually this, well, I kicked myself in the the butt, but when I had the the socialist representative, Patty, on from, uh, from Great Britain, um, we mm-hmm. were talking about socialism, and he had, at the very end had mentioned that, oh, well, you know, we all kind of believe in freedom. Every person wants to be free. And I kicked myself in the butt <laughs> because my first thought, and I always say this uh, in general, but for some reason it just left my mind. Um, but it's like, well, yes, we all want freedom, but how do we all define freedom differently? And freedom can yes. be freedom from coercion or it can be freedom to the labor of other people or freedom to things or freedom, uh, you know, from the, the, the sufferings of, of normal life and of, of existence. Certainly. And, uh, and I, God, I wish I would have said that, but maybe next time I'll have to have a line <laughs> and then, you know, readdress that. Um, I always tell those types that economic rights are human rights. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And- no. Yeah, I mean, they're essentially property rights. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, First, you know, socialists have a very different concep- conception of property than um, people that are, you know, more free market types do. So. Yes. <laughs> and, this, oof, and we hashed that out in the podcast, too, which was uh, pretty enlightening. If you guys want to check that out, if you haven't heard, yeah, I, I interviewed a socialist and we go over kind of in the same way we discussed anarchism. But like, I, you know, I, I, I challenge him, you know, here and there just to clarify things, which um, mm-hmm. is pretty interesting. But. Overall, it was a great conversation. I learned a lot about kind of their positions um, and kind of how they how they view things, which is always, it's always good to know, understand, you know, your opponents, whether for better or for worse, you know. Oh, you have to, because otherwise you don't know what you're arguing again. Absolutely. And that's the other thing, you know, I never had someone make the case to me. So it was nice to uh, <laughs> to actually have the case made before by an actual like devotee of, uh, of the art, let's say. Yes, because um, it's such a squishy term, and it's hard to it's hard to pin people down, even what the hell they. Yep. Oh, you still there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Dropped out for a second. Um, but yeah, and actually, yeah, you're exactly right. In fact, I, I did learn that there are a lot of different branches of socialism that uh, you know some like flat out reject like communism. They don't want an all powerful state, but they want this to be kind of like by a you know by a democratic process, which is kind of more their position. So it was good. You know, I don't want to get too detailed into it, but it was it was a, it was overall a good learning experience. That's important. Yeah, awesome. So I want to get to the subject at hand here. We kind of left off at the last podcast. Uh, um, or left some an open subject about the like, kind of the military policing all of these kinds of things in uh, an anarchy society, or um, you know, I guess what like would you call anarchy society? Would it just be? Isn't there another word for it? I'm thinking of. Usually, when we talk about these things, we say in a free society. In a free society, perfect. So, I guess for my first question, let's start with the military. 
Um, okay. kind of as we just kind of talked about, you know, I've been reading through the Federalist Papers, and this was, you know, basically I was reading the original argument why they wanted to have a standing army, even though not only did they have fears of a standing army, but the Anti-Federalists were flat out rejecting it uh, entirely, yeah. just given their experience. Um, and, you know, the highlights from, from what I remember from the last 20 or so are that, you know, you're looking at the difference between a more effective fighting force and a more powerful deterrent across the nation when we're looking at uh, foreign enemies in particular. Um, And also for kind of like domestic, uh, what do they call it? Uh, Domestic terrorism, but not, what are these? Domestic insurrections. Insurrections is what they said, yeah. Yes. So... And I, and I tend to agree with them. And then the idea also, you know, just to clarify, the I think the great compromise from the Federalists, and, and because they, they ultimately did achieve this, they got this into the Constitution, uh, the idea of, you know, Congress having a standing army. Um, but the, the compromise was that, well, if the government ever gets tyrannical, we have the Second Amendment. And the Second Amendment is supposed to be the great equalizer to ensure that the citizens could never be taken over by a government, no matter how big its army was, because as long as every, you know, per, every able-bodied person was able to wield a firearm, you effectively had a huge army that, I mean, would be, as they describe it, insurmountable. So, yeah, I you kind of want to get your thoughts. You did the NFA. What's that? You did until the NFA of 1934. Yes, or- yep, yep. And also before, so before I get your, your reaction and your response to everything, um, I'd also like to point out to my listeners that you have done some excellent podcasts on gun control, on Shays Rebellion. Um, I think you and you talk about the NFA and in, uh, in those, at least in the in the gun control ones, and they are excellent. And you def- you definitely should check them out. Oh, well, thanks, man. I appreciate that. No, oh, no okay. problem. Okay, go ahead. Take away. Take it away. All right. So first, I wanted to get out of the way. Have you ever read uh, *Tragedy and Hope* by Carol? Care. Sorry, you're kind of dropping in and out. I heard Tragedy and Hope by Carol, who? Quigley. Cher- no, I have not. Uh, it's a fantastic book, man. If you ever want a good read, I would probably recommend that. It's um, it's pretty dense. It's about, oh, what is it about? I think it's about 900 pages or something like Oof. that. It's a, it's a tough book, but it's very well worth it. Well, anyway, anyway he, in, here, in there, he talked the, uh, tech, like the pro- technological progression of military hardware, and he makes this distinction where, okay, so essentially, people had parity with the gov- their government as far as weapons went up until about the Middle Ages when we had the rise of knights and mounted warriors. I mean, you had chariots for a while, and then chariots fell out of favor when we had the rise of knights. And you had knights who essentially wore armor, armor that was entirely impervious to the weapons that peasants had because they mostly had pikes and you know swords, uh, clubs, things like that. Mm-hmm. And the knights dominated the battlefield up until the advent of gunpowder and then you could have a, a peasant who took two and a half hours of training to use a you know a hand cannon or a you know arquebus <laughs> back in that time mm-hmm. and they would be able to punch a hole through a knight who spent his entire life training for combat so the and then you had like the, the rise of gunpowder the age of gunpowder then you had essentially the birth of the united states and a great age of, of liberty at least for a little a while and then you saw the balance tires tip towards the way once we had military aviation armor things like that and then, of course, governments want to go disarm the people once again, which is something they've always done throughout history. So anyway, mm-hmm. the observation he makes is that whenever the people have arms on parity with the government, people are free. Whenever the government's firepower far outstrips the people's, the people lose their liberty. And mm-hmm. this dynamic has essentially led to where we are in the United States today. And as far as the founders go, I think I find it really strange that they allowed a sta- the creation of a standing army in the Constitution because one of the there's two things that just about every single founder was crystal clear on and in agreement on. Because like we talk about the founders today, we talk and we think it's just like this large monolithic group of dudes who had the same. Like, no, they had all kinds of opinions and all kinds of things, and they fought like cats and dogs. Absolutely, you know, if you just go back and write a fine debate. Mm-hmm. But just about every had two things that he was. They were all in agreement on. One was debt like government debt, and Mm -hmm. number two was a standing army. So I find it very strange that they they were the anti-federalists essentially let that one get into the ratification of the Constitution, especially the people of the several states. But anyway, so their idea, right, was that you needed a standing army for national defense, 
for, as a, as a strong deterrent. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, it was a deterrent. It was it was mainly that it was a more effective fighting force, and you see that in Article One, Section Eight, where they you know it kind of constitutes what a army is, a standing army is, as opposed to a militia, where it's organized, mm-hmm. armed, and disciplined. Um, and, you know, just the, the time it takes to rally troops together, the idea that, well, maybe, you know, people who don't want to go to war are going to find ways to avoid war. And if you're really trying to, you know, win a war and conduct a war, you can't have this, like, you just can't move bodies effectively and move people effectively and get them trained and get them to where they need to go. And it's like, by the time you, you know, get people ready to go, even if you can, you know, the battle could be already lost, essentially. Right. And of course, you also need a standing army for expeditionary war. And I think that that was a big consideration because back when the Founders era was, this continent was a vast wilderness. Mm-hmm. And they already had a problem with the Indians. And of course, you know, a big sticking point in the revolution was they stopped, the, the British stopped land speculation west of the Appalachian Mountains. Yes. So they essentially, they, I think a lot of the Founders knew that they would need a military to, con- to conquer the rest of this landmass mm-hmm. so okay okay so here's is that yes i think that yes a standing army could be a more effective deterrent uh than uh you know a, a, a decentralized militia force as far as as far as preventing an invasion but as far as stopping an invasion i do think that a decentralized actually properly trained force is far superior but that's kind of beside the point because the point is that be that as it may that a standing army army is probably more effective deterrent. The fact of the matter is you can't have one any other way unless you have a government that has the mm-hmm. power to tax coercively. Because think about what you're doing when you're standing up a military. Uh, I remember, you know, when I, when I was in the army, I was uh, 18 to 20. I think I got out when I was 23, 24. Mm-hmm. And, no, I was 23. And everybody else in my unit was about the same age. I think, you know, our, 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 our platoon leader was, I think, maybe 26, 27, something like that. So we're talking about guys that are in prime working age. So mm-hmm. you've got this massive collection of young men that are at prime working age where they could be building houses or, you know, chopping down trees or whatever. Mm-hmm. And you take them and you make them all sit in one place and essentially do nothing mm-hmm. but cost money. So you have this massive waste of resources right there just because when you have professional soldiers, that's what they do all day. And believe it or not, when you're in the in military, especially if you're in combat arms, you think, oh, these guys will be out to the range every day shooting and training mm-hmm. and uh, going on field operations. No, you spend most of your time <laughs> filling sandbags and painting rocks and cutting the grass with a pair of scissors, you know. Oh, boy. Things like this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's mind-numbingly boring. I mean, it really is. And that's, of course, because to the government, your labor has no cost. Like there's no, they're that's not correct. having to pay for you to, to be there for any other way. So that's the one thing, but here's, I think you're, what you're trying to, what you're getting at here is that, that the problem that with a stateless society is that it couldn't have a standing army. Is that right? And like, and that makes it like, how would you possibly defend it? Is that kind of where you're coming from? Yeah. I think when, if, if at least my conception of your position is that, well, you know, part of anarchism is we don't have a standing army, but then how do we address, you know, threats from other nations? How do we, uh, you know, how do we address the same things that the founders sought to correct essentially? Okay. Well, I think that it's entirely, and here's, Part of the problem with this type of thing is that it's like it's almost like you're asking me. So, Matt, so in your society, what would spaceships that go to Mars look like? <laughs> like I don't know, bro. They never been. They haven't been invented yet. And it's almost mm-hmm. the same kind of thing where it's like you know, back in the early 1920s, people were like, huh, "What would this device that makes makes uh, bread into toasted bread look like?" And it's, you know, mm-hmm. nobody could imagine. So anyway, it's it's always kind of hard to describe something that doesn't really exist yet. And this is just kind of my take on it. There's certainly other people that disagree with me that have other formulations for this, Mm -hmm. but essentially it's, it it would be possible to have a form of a standing army in a free society. There's nothing that says you couldn't have one. Now it would be extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the one problem you have with that because you're taking all these men who, you know, are a resource and you are making them idle. And of course, that's a big problem with government militaries too, is that because they don't have to pay for the resources, because they can always get more money by taxing the people, the, the lives of the men in the army have no associated costs. So just you look at the First World War, how about, we think about how stupid that was. They literally took divisions worth of men and, 
and just sent them into machine gun fire. And you had all these men, like, you could have sent the guy who made the uh, some type of technological advance, had your side win the war, but instead you drafted him, you threw him in the meat grinder, and because you didn't have to pay, you know, his... Because you didn't have to pay out of your own resources for, for his labor and his time, his life has no meaning. So that's a huge problem with government militaries. But anyway, um... And yeah, it's true that like you wouldn't have a centralized governing body that stands up a military force that forces them to train and, 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 and these types of things in a free society. So instead, I think there's a probably a different model you could take. And a lot of it, I believe, would have to do with insurance. Hmm. And OK, so think about this here. So let's say in this free society we have there's like a city. Right. And there's. There's a downtown area. There's these giant skyscrapers. There's there's football stadiums. There's all these enormous buildings, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you're going to have to – the owners of these buildings are going to want to buy insurance coverage because they could have a fire that burns down their entire building. There could be an earthquake. I mean, just like building owners today buy building insurance for commercial buildings and, and whatnot, I, people are going to be incentivized because of their own self-interest to buy insurance. So you think about this, right? You have this massive downtown area or even a small city or even a small town. And you have a group of insurance underwriters that have a massive, basically, if you're familiar with insurance at all, it's something mm -hmm. called internalizing the externalities, right? So that basically yeah. takes, that means the insurance company is taking the risk from the building owners and putting it into their organization. Yep. So now the insurance company has a massive interest in making sure that all those buildings stay standing. So they are going to be – that's going to color the way they do things because if the thing is – like, so let's say there's some, some invading army. Let's say the U.S. military, the British military comes through and decides to reconquer our little Ancapistan free society, mm -hmm. and they just send the first, you know, first infantry division in, and they start shelling the place and driving tanks down the streets. And, and of course, they're going to destroy buildings. These beautiful giant glass skyscrapers are going to have windows knocked out of them. They might get caught on fire. Who knows? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, it's the U.S. military, so they might fly a bunch of B-52s over and just carpet bomb the whole place in a rubble. I mean, <laughs> they're not above that. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, so essentially, the threat of military invasion is a real thing. And if that happens, that's, this insurance company is going to have to pay out a lot of money for all these destroyed buildings. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, these property owners that own these massive buildings and whatnot, they're rich. They're going to be able to flee before this military gets here. Because here's the other thing. Too. It's not like there would ever be a strike on a free society without some warning. Because look at what, especially by a state, because these state societies, look at what the U.S. has had to do before every single war. What do they have to do? The one thing. Mm. They have to propagandize the people into accepting oh, yeah. the war. They need the public support. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. Right. Exactly. There's a massive PR campaign before every single war. I mean, you know, the lead up to the invasion of Iraq in 2003 was almost a year. And Saddam Hussein knew the whole time that we were coming. He just couldn't stop us when we got there. Mm -hmm. He had known. So it wouldn't be hard to tell that an attack is coming. And of course, of course, you know, I'm sure that this insurance company would have some interest in maybe launching satellites to take pictures or having early warning radar systems or something like this. So they can predict things just like they'd be predicting when an earthquake is going to happen or the risk of fire buildings and, and things like that. So that's really interesting. So I, yeah, I, yeah, I get your idea that essentially the, the concerns right now are kind of taken over by government in terms of like foreign policy, where their job is mm -hmm. to kind of monitor what's going on. And if they don't mm -hmm. exist, then what you're saying is that it's possible that insurance companies would assume those responsibilities, given that it's a, it's, it is a, a potential threat that no one else is taking responsibility for. So if they are aware of what's going, you know, it'll, it'll have, they'll have an economic incentive to know what's going on around the world to see where, you know, if militaries are moving, where are they moving to, this and that. And, and that's, that's pretty interesting. And they'd be watching foreign news sources and whatnot. And I think the thing is, the reason insurance companies make sense, because number one, they exist in our society. They're easy to conceptualize. Number two, because people are buying policies, because here's the thing is that, you know, if your house burns down, you can't go get welfare. So you're going to have an incentive to, to protect your your house. So the, mm -hmm. the insurance companies are essentially getting money from all corners of the society, all the property owners there. So not only do they have a stake, of course, like we said, in everything, but they also have, you know, the funds at their disposal. And essentially, it's almost like, it's 
almost they have funds from everyone in the community to ensure things get done in the community's interest. Because here's the bottom line is that if government monopolized food production and if they had always grown all the corn and beef and everything like that, and if I came along to and said to somebody, hey, you know what? I think it's a much better idea if private farmers grow this stuff. People would say, oh, my gosh, you want everybody to starve. How would we possibly have food without – and that's the problem is that when a, a – when a, a service has been monopolized for all of our lifetimes, it's hard for people to conceptualize how it could be any other way. And I understand that. I think that's, mm-hmm. I mean, this was like the big sticking point for me for the longest time was figuring out police and courts and military and things like that. Mm-hmm. And really the truth is the defense part is easy. The law part is the hard, the hard part conceptually, but we can get to that a little later. We'll try to, you know, kind of, kind of stay on the subject. So anyway, sure. and if you think about it, right. So the government, right, the, the state has no inherent right to defend itself or anything like that. What this is, is that we as human beings have a right to self-defense. We just happen in the original constitutional system to delegate our right of self-defense to the state. So that was always kind of the way it was. And in this way, it's essentially really no different. So let's say, for example... One of the things that insurance companies would, would do is, is that, and I'm sure maybe it would be in the contracts where it's like, okay, so uh, if you're going to insure against fire, you want to make sure that these buildings are not going to burn down very easily, make sure they're not made out of you know matchsticks or something like that. So mm-hmm. they would have, insurance companies would have inspectors, and part of your contract is to say, hey, hey, if our inspector shows up unannounced, like you have to let him in and let him do his inspection, and that way we can make sure that you have a, a working sprinkler system and fire alarms and, and, and things like that. Sure. I mean, we do this now. Exactly. And, you know, if you have a burglar alarm on your house, usually your insurance company will give you a discount because that makes it less likely they'll have to indemnify you if your house gets broken in. It makes it less likely. And you could do this essentially from all angles. So let's say the insurance company has got a massive interest in not having these buildings burned down. So maybe they go downtown, right, buy a little piece of land, and they put up a fire department right there so that way if there is a fire they could respond right away boom like that and you know i mean we have volunteer fire departments in america today like they don't have to pay guys full time to stand around there with a fire happens they could just pay guys part time to say hey if there's a fire happens if we call you get down here get on the apparatus and we'll tell you where to go something like that yeah i mean the all, same thing with go ahead go ahead uh, say so the same thing with like security upgrades as far as like domestic security so let's say that you have a big you know office complex and let's say your insurance company will give you a discount for putting up security cameras, for hiring security personnel. And because they'll be liable in case those security personnel decide to take their billy cubs and crack someone's skull from they might require that your security personnel passes certain certification tests, make has certain types of training on de escalation and make sure qualified and competent with whatever weapons they have. So mm-hmm. with these types of things, you can see like where I'm going with this, but go ahead. Yeah. Which, Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, it, make, it makes a lot of sense for like preventative measures and like who's going to look at this stuff if government isn't looking at it. I think you made a pretty compelling case that, yeah, I mean, something something will take its place so long as there is some value in it. And like you said, we already have uh, insurance that does a lot of these things, these preventative measures. And, you know, perhaps without a lot of the government uh, regulations that, that, you know, take away revenues and create additional costs to people. You know, and, and again, also even with competition, I mean, you know, there's other, there's more than one insurance company and maybe oh, yeah. one is trying to outcompete the other. He might say, oh, these guys are providing these discounts. Let's open up a fire department or, you know, a specialized security department. Oh, if you go with us, we will have, you know, our guards come in and they'll guard your place and we'll do the, the you know, who, who knows? I mean, the possibilities are, yeah. are endless. Um, Sky's the limit. Yeah. I do want to so, know one thing. You kind of said that the Constitution... Uh, we we kind of outsourced our self defense to the government. I don't know if I would necessarily agree with that. I would say that we we delegated them the authority to deal with things that are overseas and abroad. And I think you know the Second Amendment specifically is kind of our declaration that listen, the right of the people, you know, the, well, the right of the people have the right of self defense against tyranny. And you know, as I always tell people, right. you know, their conception of it was more more towards this idea of a tyrannical government. But tyranny could be uh, a criminal in your house. Tyranny could be a group of men coming to attack your business, like, you know, during the L.A. riots. Tyranny could be, well, you know, anything, anything coming after your life, or, you know, after you illegitimately. 
Yeah. And I mean, that was so well understood then, it essentially went without saying. Yes, like, absolutely. If you would have walked went back in time with the founders, like, hey, guys, make sure you put in a provision in this co- in this document so we can protect ourselves from criminals. They look at you like, dude, are you out of your mind? Yeah, of course yep. you can do that. Yep. <laughs> it wasn't even a question. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But, but things have changed so much in our society. Oh, geez. Okay, so let me um pick up where you, I left off. I don't mind. So it was my, uh, sure. So sure. just like we have fire department and, or, you know, fire, fire protection, or they would have uh, discounts for people security officers present they can also say okay well how about this we offer you a discount if you let us put up some uh shortwave radar and a couple surface air missile batteries on top of your skies or they could do things like i mean it's certainly entirely possible for the insurance company to have to stand up its own forces and i think the the best way you could probably conceptualize this is to have citizen soldiers Mm-hmm. to say hey and of course because you're gonna have private policyholders that get their cars insured get their homes insured get their business insured but say hey if you are willing to send either yourself or somebody in your household down to us to get training to get equipment to uh be part of our defense force then we'll give you a big fat discount on your insurance policy so i think it's a real good way to incentivize people to to perform this service mm-hmm. so there is a certainly a possible way for for the insurance company to stick its own force. However, I don't think the insurance companies would have a whole lot of interest in actually performing that function. Maybe they would purchase some hardware, but I think what's far more likely is that, so let's, for example, this, and we have, and I think one thing you have to keep in mind is that we would all be fan, because there's no government, we would all be fantastically wealthy in the society. I mean, if you look at all the, the stealing and the waste that goes on in <laughs> modern day America, like what mm-hmm. if the entire federal budget was given back to the people who, where it came from? What if the mm-hmm. dollar was still backed by gold? You know, how much, how, how rich would you be if you had 97% more money? Obviously you'd probably be doing pretty well. And mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's just like if everything you went and bought today, the price was cut in half, how much better off would you be? How much more stuff would you buy? So, and, you know, like the, the state obviously regulates the market for the benefit of multinational corporations. And also one thing I had, wanted to add that I didn't say a second ago mm-hmm. is that markets, of course, that's where demand and supply comes together. So the great thing about markets is as whenever there's a demand for something, if there's enough, even if there's not that much, it'll still be met. And we all want to feel safe and secure. Mm-hmm. Every single human being on the planet wants these things. It's one of, you know, you look at Maslow's hierarchy, security is pretty low down on the bottom. So the fact that there's this massive demand for security services means that entrepreneurs would rise up to meet. And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, in the same way that insurance has this interest in not wanting these properties destroyed, I think probably what mm-hmm. they would do instead is they would probably make contracts ahead of time with, with private military private defense companies some of these companies that would run private police forces they might be able to double as such uh mm-hmm. like, there's you know several ways to that they can form it you know you might have a community of you know former u.s military vets that all get that that live there somewhere and they say okay you know what we actually don't need a private defense force because we all got guns and if someone tries to be you know we're gonna give them their own vietnam here <laughs> so <laughs> you, you know, I mean, like you think about this last generation of veterans, man, we're all Iraq and Afghanistan. We've all been fighting against irregular warfare, guerrilla type forces. And a lot of these, a lot of guys in, you know, veterans of my generation have learned a lot about irregular warfare. Mm-hmm. So you turn that back around on a conventional military. I mean, you know, you're going to give, <laughs> you're going to give whatever good it comes there a lot. So anyway, there, so because of all this excess wealth, maybe these insurance companies would spend some money on r and and they might anti-ballistic missile batteries. They they could install these skyscrapers. Sometimes with electronic countermeasures that mess with the um, targeting systems in missiles and bombs. You could have EMPs that any jets that are flying close, they could trigger the EMP to you know kill all the electrical systems in the jets and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. But I think what would be more likely is let's say we have this army coming to invade our you know our free society yeah that was my next question actually is how how would you do so i get like the preventative measures and like that could that could go and you know that could be endless whatever that is uh but what what do you do when you know the the boats hit the shore and they're here now okay so one there's there's some problems you have okay so you know you're 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 a conservative right so i'm Mm -hmm. i'm pretty sure that you are a believer in the free market yeah absolutely and 
Okay, absolutely cool. So the thing is, is that we, especially there's this kind of saying in the libertarian community, the government isn't good at anything except for killing people. But the truth is, and we, you know, it's like, it's obviously it's said tongue in cheek, but the truth is <laughs> they're not even any good. <laughs> interesting <laughs> right and, and the thing is like the market system I, I think you'll agree with me is far superior to a socialist centrally planned economy. oh ab- absolutely so, the numbers bear it out without a doubt right so if you wouldn't want tvs built that way then why would you leave something as important as your nation's survival to that and of course we see there's some obvious things like you know when you're getting your money from taxes you can't you don't know the price signals. You don't know the cost of resources. You don't know where to apply them. Like you see all the massive ways. Like look at the F thirty five, man. I mean, it's just it's <laughs> absolutely insane, and no proper afford to keep that coming. So that's that's kind of where I'm coming from. Is that if you let the market, it'll it'll allocate resources far better. But as far as the actual, and that goes as far as like building up supplies. You know, and of course, obviously, you're going to have to build things like armor systems and heavy guns, cruiser weapons in advance, of course. Yes, mm-hmm. obviously. And I think that there would be, you know, the insurance company might stockpile those weapons for private militaries if in case they didn't have to maintain them and, and hang on to them or things like that. But anyway, so one thing that you cannot do in the U.S. military today, you cannot post bounties, at least for the most. You can't, you can't what? Can you repeat that? You can't post bounties. Post bounties. Okay. So let's say for, we have this, like, Boats are on the shore, like you said, you have this military coming to invade our city. Mm-hmm. Well, the insurance company that, that insures and underwrites all those businesses and skyscrapers, they say, all right, private militaries, guess what? For every soldier you kill, I'll give you $1,000. For every tank you blow up, I'll give you $10,000. For every helicopter you shoot down in the sky, I'll give you $50,000. <laughs> so you're going to have all these companies tripping over each other to come go and kill these invaders because – I mean, that's a great financial incentive. Not only will you cover the cost of your operations, but you also make out like a bandit. And this gives, I mean, the incentive of survival is pretty strong on the modern battlefield. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, if you look at how uh, military conquest has been, or military operations have happened forever. Are you familiar with the prize system in the the Navy? Pride? No, I'm not. Okay, so the U.S. Navy was like this for a long time, too. So, uh... One thing that they would do whenever, like in the Civil War, this was actually really pretty well known. Um, so, of course, the North was blockading the South. And mm-hmm. one of the most desirable duties that U.S. Navy sailors would have be blockade duty. Because if your ship captured a blockade runner, you got to keep it. Your whole crew would get to keep the ship's cargo and a ship. They would get. And they would split the money all around the crew. So crews had a massive incentive to go out and not to be lazy and just sit there, but to go and actually hunt down blockade ships, not let them get away. And it had the side effect of instead of destroying these ships, it incentivized them to capture them Mm -hmm. and make sure that their contents would be intact. So that's a nice thing because one thing I, I think we'll get into a little later, I think a lot of these institutions as time would go on will become nonviolent because of the liability involved with killing people. But anyway, so that's, mm-hmm. that's essentially the idea is that because this financial incentive that, that fighters have, they're, they're probably going to be able to perform better. Hmm. And Interesting. one problem we have with the U S military is, is that in combat, combat arms is essentially one of the easiest jobs to get into because you don't have to have very high ASVAB score. And what happens is guys will go in in other MOSs. And they'll get kicked out of the MOS. But they won't get kicked out of the military. They'll get kicked out of the MOS into a comp. So there are people in combat arms units that really don't want to be there. <laughs> I mean, so, yeah, but and, if they're forced to be there, their performance is going to decline, I would assume. Certainly. And that's with an all-volunteer army. Yeah, that's a good point. Because, you, well, you, you know, they, they say it's an all-volunteer army, but like you said, I mean, they can kind of, once you sign the contract, I from what I've heard... Um, is that they can pretty much do whatever they want with you, send you where they want, kind of put you where they think you could best be, or, you know, put, put you where you're most efficient by their understanding, by their measures. Me and my buddy Pat from Uncensored Tactical just did a whole show on this that'll be dropping, I think, this week on my channel, which is the status quo. But yeah, I mean, we, our joke is always, it's, it's volunteer to sign up, but 
that's the last voluntary decision you make. <laughs> you know, it's not voluntary to leave. You can't quit. <laughs> well, again, like if you sign the contract for a, a year or you know, four years, whatever it is, I, I kind of, you know, I, I get that they want you for the four years then. Unless, the, you know, I, I assume there's no kind of buyout, quote unquote, like there's no way to get out of it. No, uh, now, now officers, they can quit, essentially. And, Interesting. But the way their contracts are a little different, they have what's called an NSO, which stands for military service obligation. So it's not quite, quite the same thing. Like, yeah, if you say, screw this, I quit, I'm not going to work today as an enlisted guy, they'll throw you to throw. And you'll probably do about a year, and they'll let you out with a, a, of an honorable discharge, which is not something you want. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you are an officer, you can basically resign your commission at any time and even if you're an rotc officer like if you went if military the worst thing that happens is they charge you back for the tuition that they pay for oh interesting yeah (laughs) so well a lot of ins and outs here so essentially you're saying that that again it's kind of the market forces of uh would would say listen there's there's you know prices will allocate the incentives and, and change people's behavior. So if there's people on the shores, we obviously have this massive incentive to keep ourselves safe, keep our property safe. So uh-huh. that is the incentive that will drive money into that area. And people will, who are seeking to get that money will, you know, answer that call. And then we essentially have that, uh, you know, that effective fighting force in addition to, you know, existing, uh, second amendment armed citizens. Oh Yeah. Anybody that wants a gun in the society is going to be able to own one for the most part. And that's, yeah, absolutely. And of course, I think, like I said earlier, I think on top of the, I think you, maybe, who knows, these insurance companies, they might maintain small professional units, like Mm -hmm. guys that are just, but there would also be that system where it's like, okay, if you have a policy from us, let's say you send yourself down to our training center or your 18 year old kid and he comes down and he drills like uh one weekend a month (laughs) two weeks out of the year or something like that (laughs) and we train him how to shoot and how to navigate land how to how to you know build defense works how to build a fighting position how to do all these different things Mm -hmm. and if we ever get invaded we're gonna call you and we need you to come down here and in return we'll give you a big fat discount on your insurance policy People like, especially in the state system, don't realize how valuable the most valuable resource any general has is his soldiers. Now, it's unfortunate mm-hmm. most generals don't think like that, but that's the absolute truth. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. one big problem, of course, you also have in the political system is that there's no consequences for anybody, any of the officers. You look at these guys like David Petraeus, uh, Stanley McChrystal, like we had litanies of failed generals roles in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And what happened? They get to retire at, at their full rank. They're never busted down. They never get their pay docked. They never get reprimanded. And they get out and they get jobs with the, as a CIA director. They get jobs in big mm-hmm. fat defense contractor companies. There's no consequences for failure, which there's unequivocally, no matter what you think about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, we've, the U.S. military has failed its objective in both of them. Oh, yeah. I mean, the idea of creating a a free society in the Middle East with a a people that aren't exactly receptive to Western ideas. Yeah, I mean, it was crazy from the start. Um, You can't, you know, Boris Yeltsin, I didn't mean to cut you off, dude, but Boris Yeltsin has this famous quote. It's like, you can build a throne of bayonets, but you can't sit on it for very long. (laughs) That's interesting. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, you know, especially like, I, you know, as someone who, uh, you know, I was probably what, in like fifth grade or something. Or maybe, you know, seventh grade, I think it was, when uh, 9-11 happened. And so it's like, for me, it's, you know, you're a young kid, you don't have a lot of experience or a lot of knowledge or anything, but you have a lot of passion. And I think that's, you know, I think that's what happened in that, with that generation. You had people, you know, that happened, you had people who knew people down there. Um, You know, I had family go down there when it was, when it was going on to go uh, support the the police down there, like protecting the zone and everything. So... Uh Uh, it was a big deal, and I think a lot of people were pissed off. And I remember it was, a, you know, I mean, that was probably the most united I've ever seen America ever. We were pissed off. We got attacked, and we wanted blood, and that's exactly what we did. Um, I think George Bush tried to, you know, make it a little bit more virtuous, which I don't agree with at this point in my life. I think you got to keep war. Uh, to, you know, war has to be this bloody, horrible, terrible thing that no one ever wants to do. It can't be this great, virtuous. No, we're we're going there to kill people. This isn't this isn't good. This isn't a nice thing. Um, no, we can try to church it up argue. all we want, but you know that that's just my take right. on it. And just like you said, I mean, it, it was a failure from the start. We can't. I mean, our objective should have been, at least in my opinion, and you can correct me if I'm if I'm mistaken, but 
if you're going to go to war, you go there, you kill people, you break stuff, you get out. You, you, you get rid of right. the people who were, who were bothering you, and you, you leave. And that's it. That's all you yeah. can do. Yes. Now, I think it's part of it's the folly of expeditionary warfare in the first place, because I think if you're fighting a war away from your shores, I think you, it's, it's much, 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 much more difficult to come up with an actual, like, a moral justification for doing such a thing. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of, you know, let's say you... It's, it's, it's like if I go over to your house, it's a lot harder for me to explain that than it is if, you know, we, you and I are not my house and I kill you. You know what I mean? Yeah, different so, context. Absolutely. Right. Exactly. So the problem, of course, if, if you, I, if I would say that going, the problem with George Bush and them is I firmly believe that they exploited the hell out of the situation, just like bin Laden wanted them to, because they have been wanting Saddam Hussein's head on a, pl- a platter for a long time. And even Ron Paul, like Ron Paul, who made his, made his real mark on the world being an anti-war right winger, essentially like a, you know, a free market Liberty guy. He, he made, he voted for the, the, the AUMF to go to into Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. And his idea was that, We'd send some CIA operators over there, maybe some, maybe some Army Rangers, Delta Force, Navy SEALs, whatever. We'd go and get these couple hundred Talib, or, uh, Al-Qaeda guys and be done with it. Mm-hmm. But, of course, that's not what happened. And, uh, you know, Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11, period. There's, there's never been a substantive link proven. All of the evidence that they, pr- that they showed to the UN and, and Colin Powell and all that was all debunked. At, most of it was done at the time. It's just, you know, people were angry. They didn't want to listen. And, yeah, I do remember... That being the most united America has been, and but that's just my problem with government, man, is that they, they take our best qualities and they use it against us. Like mm-hmm. you had America United, you had them feeling so bad for these people that got attacked down at the World Trade Center because no matter what you can say about American foreign policy, whether you think it's good or bad or not, obviously the people at the Trade Center probably didn't have anything to do with it. They yeah. certainly, sure certainly didn't deserve. It. So we got you know this righteous anger for for us being attacked but the problem is number one the politicians created that problem in the first place like jimmy carter started back in the mujahideen in the 1970s yep. reagan did it so did bush up until clinton and essentially we use these guys to lure the soviets into afghanistan and then after that you saw the two biggest problems that Bin Laden had with the United was our unwavering support of Israel and the fact that Israel had bombed a bunch of refugee camps in Lebanon and the sanctions regime in Iraq during the Clinton and Clinton. And I tell you what, man, when I was in Iraq, I talked to people through the interpreter that had lived through. They talked about how, you know, like if you had a child, like people didn't even get that attached to their kids because they knew they were going essentially. I mean, it was really something, man. They're like, it's left an indelible mark on that society. So anyway, mm-hmm. this is what Bin Laden's, you know, this is what his, his, uh, causes belly was for attacking the United States. And these people that we entrust with our security, they are so busy going around the world, pursuing their own goals, their own agenda that they put us at risk, which is absolutely unacceptable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I understand that. I, I feel you entirely on that. Um, I kind of want to shift gears a little bit uh, sure. into policing. I uh, just got final thoughts on uh, on kind of foreign policy. I guess to summarize, you know, your main position is that uh, insurance companies would be able to take over pretty much all the responsibilities that the federal government does now in terms of uh, foreign policy and uh, foreign uh, defense. I guess. Um, kind of, as far as as far as organized defense, they would probably take over a lot of those those functions. But I think mm-hmm. one thing that it's important and understand the, the concepts in a free society is decoupling a lot. And one thing would be to decouple the law, like the production of law from the police and the enforcement. Mm-hmm. Another would be to decouple, you know, procurement of supplies with who actually, you know, who actually uses weapons and things like that. And for, as far as foreign policy goes, as far as like dealing with foreign nations, that's up to individual businesses and individual people as far as who they want to trade with, who they want to talk to. Now, obviously, 
Mm-hmm. We can't have guys going and taking fighter jets, taking off from Ancapistan and go bombing places because that's just going to bring trouble back on our doorstep. And that's not the type of people we want around right. here. But that's of course, point. course, you know, one thing that we have to keep in mind, especially when it comes to policing, is in order to have a free society, it just it doesn't mean just like a society that has no state. No, to have a free society, you have to have a people that are you know, overwhelmingly, for the most part, committed to things like private property um, and, you know, the non-aggression principle, human rights. So Mm -hmm. you're not going to have a bunch of warmongers in in a place like this. Yeah, and I I agree with that. And I think this is my, I guess, really my final question on uh, the subject, at least for military, is that, you know, even if you have this society of non-aggression principle, even if you could achieve that, um, you know, the, the, the... I guess my understanding of human nature is that not everyone is going to agree on that. If you can find a collection of people that do agree on it, great, but you're going to have to defend yourself against people who disagree with that as well. Certainly. And I think, you know, something that the non-aggression principle a lot of times gets mixed up with pacifism. And there's a difference between somebody who's peaceful and somebody who's, you know, somebody who's harmless is like, you know, like a little bunny rabbit or like a fly or something like Mm -hmm. that. It's like, it can't hurt you even if it wanted to, but peaceful is like a rat snake right you mm-hmm. know the snake can bite you and possibly you know give you a real nasty wound or maybe even kill you depending on what kind of snake it is mm-hmm. but it's just sitting there chilling and it's not trying to attack you so to be a peaceful person you have to have the capacity for and mm-hmm. yeah i mean yes not everybody is going to agree with all these things and, and but here's the thing is that if a guy goes and stirs up a bunch of trouble in a foreign country because he's going around over there killing people saying that he's doing it in the name of Kapistan, it's like you know, dude, you're going to bring a bunch of problems down on all of us, just like the Taliban found out in 2001. Mm-hmm. Uh, the thing is, like, if somebody like that, it's like, man, I don't want to be associated with someone like that. I don't want to do business with somebody like that. Well, he essentially assumes want... responsibility for his actions then instead of, yeah. you know, in Kapistan. <laughs> right. So it's like if the authorities of whatever country come over here looking for you, like, dude, we're not going to shelter you. We're going to give you up, man. you got to go answer for your crimes. You killed innocent people or, or what? Um, however, like part of that is also, it's like, well, we don't have to do, there's no anti-discrimination laws. Like we don't have to do business with this guy. You know, the the grocery store doesn't have to sell him food. The power Mm -hmm. company doesn't have to sell him power at his house. They don't have to sell him water, these types of things. So Mm -hmm. I'm pretty soon that he's going to have to move because he literally cannot get things he needs. So that's like one way that a free society has to essentially, you know, to try to stop bad behavior. Interesting. Awesome. Well, I want to shift gears a little bit into the uh, the idea of policing, and I guess sure. Um, really, the question here is that you know, without it, well, I guess with a limited state um, mm-hmm. in an ANCAP society, there are, you know there has to be laws because you know you have to regulate the evil nature of human beings. You just there's no other way around it. Um, what does enforcement of that look like? I mean, I would assume you guys have a uh, a private police force as opposed to a public police force, and or you know, correct me if I'm wrong. That's my vision of it, and that you know, and there's some interesting, uh, I think, consequences with that. And uh, I just kind of want want to have you explore that a little bit. Sure. Okay. So, like I said before, like actually providing the defense, like the concept for that's pretty easy. The hard part is how is law made. Mm-hmm. So. That's what I wanted to talk about real quick first. Sure, yeah. That. You're absolutely right. So, that is super important. Cool. People assume that there has to be this kind of centralized agency monopoly for making law. Like, we can only have one legislature. We can only have one lawmaking body. Um, now, clearly, and we'll get into this here more in a second, like, there's not the only, that's not the only way to come to consensus. It's like, for example, look at batter. Batteries, there's no uh, there's no Bureau of Batteries in the federal government, but somehow we came up with standardized sizes of all types and kinds. Now, of course, the government came in behind that and decided, oh, we're going to regulate this to make sure there's no irregular batteries that are blown up. It's like the, the mm-hmm. companies that were making batteries were like, well, it makes no sense for me to make batteries that don't fit people's consumer goods. So, <laughs> the, what I'm, <laughs> you know, yes. like what I'm trying to say here is that there there are multiple ways that a marketplace, a free society could get to some sort of consensus on what's legal and and what is not. So of course it's like you have to ask the obvious question, not to get too you know, not to wax too philosophical here. I mean, 
look, you know, part of this is you got a guy who makes dick jokes on his podcast to come and explain these very high-minded stuff. It's probably on you. <laughs> so we have to ask you, like, what, what is law, right? And what would the law be in a libertarian society? Oh, well, the law is we'd have things like what defines property rights, who's the aggressor, who's the victim, what constitutes self-defense, you know, who's liable for damages, these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Now, I think – People, like we said, to live in this free society, people have to believe in freedom. Part of that, at least from a libertarian perspective, is believing in individual rights, individual liberty. Part of private property rights is that you own your body. And because you own your body, somebody can't kill you and take in and steal your life from you, you know, unjustly. Mm-hmm. That's aggression. So most people will be operating under the understanding that they can't go around murdering people. Like we all know it's wrong to walk up to some guy and some stranger and shoot him in the face. Like that's pretty obvious. Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And as far as building the law goes from that point, like you look at, there are models that have already existed for this type of thing. First is the English common law. Right. Mm -hmm. And this was essentially where there was, cause there's two different types of legal theories, right? There's or the legal codes. You have common law and then you have statutory law. Yes. So statutory law is like, you know, like the French, the French, the best example. And of course in the United States, we have some of both. That's where a legislature passes laws and saying, this is illegal. This is legal. This is that, this is that, uh, that's one thing. But common law of course is for your listeners benefit. That's where a judge hears a case and makes a ruling based on what he thinks the legal print, principles that hold up underpin the society what they should be so oh, that's you have to, i think i didn't know i that. think what we yeah and what the law becomes is basically hmm. the judges go through past rulings see if something similar has happened and the legal precedent that was set upon so essentially that's how a, a whole series of case law gets built is based on previous court cases and the the rulings of judges now of course um Part of this is like you have to kind of move your thinking a little bit, and it's this kind of complex. You do have to kind of stretch your brain a little bit to kind of wrap your head around it. Sure. Gosh, that's a bunch of mixed metaphors. So um, <laughs> anyway, like you, you, we have to get away from this idea. There's there's this national model. Like there's a there's one size fits all law. You know, every place in the United States is governed by federal law. Got to trash that. Got to get rid of that. I think it's more likely every single community would have its own specific set of legal codes. Now, like I said, because it's a a free society, everybody's going to know everywhere like, hey, you can't go around stabbing people. You can't rape kids. You can't rape anybody, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, these types of things. Mm -hmm. So and if we look at the other models we have for this type of things, like we have a we have a private court system and private legal system today in this country. Arbitration. You uh, sign a contract with an employer. Most of the time, they're going to have a clause in there that says, if you get into a dispute over wages or whatever, you agree to go to arbitration. And so if you have a dispute between you and your employer, you both agree to go to a third party that's going to hear your case. And this is something I think we would see a lot more. And, of course, then we have to ask ourselves, like, why does arbitration even exist in the first place? Well, obviously, it's because government courts are not that great. They're slow. They're expensive. They can be very unfair. There's this massive bureaucracy you have to navigate. Think about so every prison in Ohio, most states, I'm sure, has a has a law library, and they have legal books on all the uh, state laws, federal laws. They have books on legal theory. They have books on you know procedural things and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's an enormous library. Part of what like what is so frustrating is that. You know, let's say you wanted to file a motion to get judicial release or to, to have your case appealed or something like that. Well, the number of copies you need and the number of places they need to go, the varies county by county in Ohio. So let's say, in, you know, for example, in um, Delaware County, let's say you have you have to uh, for a motion, you have to submit one copy to the clerk of courts, one to the judge, one to the prosecutor, one to the police department. I mean, who knows? Like these things, are, they're, it's insanely complex. Mm-hmm. So obviously this shows just part of the problem with government courts. The fact of the matter is like you have to have – basically have to be a lawyer to navigate the thing. Absolutely. But let's take it back to um, the, you know our system today. So the Supreme Court, like what do they do? They render – and since you're a constitutional guy, you'll know this. Mm-hmm. They render opinions. Like, mm-hmm. they don't give rulings, right? Well, so, yeah, it's what's interesting. And actually, I was going to kind of not to interrupt you, but 
you know, this, I'm kind of blown away by this idea of common law being established by judges, because to me, that suggests that, well, the proper role of judging then is to create law, which I firmly disagree with. I mean, the more I study the courts, the more I despise them, and the more I think we would be better off just abolishing them. I and just like when there's a case, just, you know, take someone out of the phone book and make them the judge, and I think you'd get a better <laughs> outcome. Um, but that's interesting. Well, and now you're, you know, you're kind of saying uh, that, that that's how it kind of is the common laws like that and that how judges issue instead of issue you know opinions can equate to law whereas i come from a school that would suggest that you know there's a difference between interpretation and judgment and right. you know interpretation means that you can take the words and define what they mean based on what you think because you're a judge uh whereas judgment suggests that no you have to take the words for what they mean in their proper context and then apply those words to the the facts of the situation well, there is one key difference, and I, I understand your concern, but look at how judges mm-hmm. are appointed in the U.S. system, right? Yes. So they have lifetime appointments, yep. which means basically once they can get in, they can do whatever they – but who basically. appoints them? Congress, right? So well, the president appoints Congress, them, and then they're confirmed by Congress the – Congress confirms them. Yes. So yes. Yeah, it's, it's, but, it's, I'm being ridiculous, but go on. <laughs> but so the thing is, so they're, because it's a lifetime appointment, they're only going to pick people that kind of – you know, kind of go with their worldview. Anyway. And guess what? People that go into politics, they want power. And people that go into federal politics, I'm sure all think the federal government should have more power. So they're going to pick judges. They're going to side with the state. Absolutely. And you find this on every single level. And here's the problem is that the courts are monopoly. If you don't like the way the court rules on your criminal case, guess what? You're out of luck. Yeah, no recourse. <laughs> right. And if, if it all the, word, the best you can hope for is a change of venue. That's it. Um, so are you ready? Absolutely. Okay. So instead of having a monopolized court system where there's only one court you can go to and that's it. And if you're not being treated fairly, you're out of luck. You have no recourse. You have no nothing except to, except to appeal to another court based on the same people that just gave you this crappy ruling. And if you think about it here, like, okay. So if you're in a courtroom, right. And you are, uh, being tried for whatever. Well, the judge, the prosecutor, all of the jury, and your lawyer all draw their paychecks from the same organization. Mm-hmm. Not very fair. But anyway, that's we'll kind of pick that up, up here in a second. Mm-hmm. So, like we said, you know, basically the Supreme Court is using opinions. Now, I can understand like judicial activism in our current system being a worry, and I think it's a huge problem too. Mm-hmm. But that's because the Supreme Court, essentially, everybody has gotten this idea that they make binding decisions, and mm-hmm. uh, they're really not supposed to. Absolutely. So that's a, that's a huge problem with kind of these courts. So as far as like a private system, we have to take it in slightly a different direction. And I think the first thing you would have is that you would have people that were experts in a subject area um, – be judges, and they would offer their services on the market as such. They would be essentially private judges. So when a dispute arises, their reputation would be everything for them to get business because there's a thing. Nobody has to use them as a judge. And if they are well known for picking picking one side over the other, picking women over men, so whatever, like they're not going to last very long because nobody, nobody wants that. Instead, they're going to have to have a reputation in fairness and objectivity otherwise they're not going to get any business and because they're not a monopoly they have to serve the customer best serve mm-hmm. you know they have to they have to essentially they they have to do the best job for them to stay in business because like we see you know crappy fast food restaurants don't make it like there's no more there's hardly any more captain d's anymore i mean it's probably a regional thing but you know <laughs> <laughs> never even Same heard of it thing. so you're right <laughs> fair enough <laughs> And as far as, you know, government judges, of course, they have no incentive to be impartial. They have no incentive to be fair. Uh, they are essentially, there's an ideological bias from every level of government because government picks the judges. They're going to mostly pick ju- judges. You know, it's a big club and you ain't in it. And you don't get into that club unless you have the same type of ideology that everybody else does. Mm-hmm. And there's really no check on their power. Not really much of one. I mean, yeah, Congress has some limited power. To, to, to censure judges and things like that, but really not that much. So, so you know, like I talked before, like everybody in that courtroom draws the check from the same agency. Like what, I mean, how would you feel if 
in this private society, the judge, let's say you work for McDonald's, you had a problem with McDonald's, then you go in the courtroom to settle your dispute. The judge is paid by McDonald's, the prosecutor's paid by McDonald's, your attorney's paid by McDonald's, all the jury members are paid by McDonald's. You'd be like, no, screw this. This is not fair at all. Like, I'm not doing this. And, you know, it's the same, same type of way. And I think as far as your other concern, uh, talking about how uh, interpretation versus uh, like judgment, mm-hmm. I think look, I think the best way to look at it would be like this: like, who defines what words mean? I mean, you know, on a surface level, you could say, yeah, dictionary publishers define what words mean, and no, of course not. Words don't go in the dictionary until they've been in common use for a while. So, mm-hmm. who decided? And that would be a consensus of all of us that use the English language. Because the centralized bureau of English language, or you know, at least not yet, there there is. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there probably will be someday. <laughs> but mm-hmm. I, I digress for now. So <laughs> kind of what I'm saying is this is that the the law would come from uh judges deciding case law and you know, so, so let's say that you have and I'll give you an example so it's more concrete here in a minute. So mm-hmm. Based off of, you know, we have the kind of the basic principles, don't kill people, don't take their stuff, don't steal from them. That's all covered. But as far as, you know, a dispute between an employer, let's say uh, you, your employer fires you and they say, you know, they're supposed to pay you a bonus and your employer says, no, kick rocks, we're not going to pay you. You broke the contract. Well, now you got a problem. So mm-hmm. maybe you both pick a judge. It might be in your employment contract to use one of a certain number of judges already. So you both go to this judge, and then they hear the case out. Maybe the judge goes back and looks at previous disputes between employers and employees, see if there's anything relevant to basically kind of see like what consensus the greatest legal minds in our society, in this society, have come up with. And it'd be essentially the same way, you know, that things like pop up in a dictionary. Dictionary words get their definition from people using them, not from, not from uh, the dictionary writers themselves. And as part of the society, of course, because we have scholars in this society that write stuff on legal theory, you know, you people have in this society, you have people codifying principles in books, you know, on how the law should work in a just society. You know, maybe you'd have like Murray Rothbard is my kind of ideological spirit animal. So, you know, you might have a bunch of people that believe in Murray Rothbard's kind of natural rights theory. People that believe in utilitarianism might put that out there. You might have like Hans Hermann Hoppe fans uh, coming up with their theory on rights and property and things like that. So judges would draw from all this work and they would use what's relevant from these different theories, maybe time together, something like that, to render their opinions. And of course, they would draw on precedent case law that came beforehand. The market would determine who served the public best, and the best judges there that served the public best would get the most cases. And essentially, it's almost like a, you, you know, who knows? Before you go see somebody that you're having a dispute with, like to pick a judge, you might look on their Yelp page <laughs> or, or whatever exists <laughs> in that in that uh, in that society like that mm-hmm. see, to see what other people have said about them. Because here's the thing: is that it's it's a lot of, it's really a big objection jeez a big objection that people have for the system it's like well why wouldn't a company pick a judge that just favored them all the time or why wouldn't a comp you know why wouldn't if two people are having a divorce maybe the 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 woman wouldn't want to pick her brother in law or you know or I guess she wouldn't want to yeah. pick her in law divorce, but. <laughs> yeah, she wouldn't want the brother in law well <laughs> right. I guess it depends is she hooking up with them or not I mean it all depends Ooh, yeah <laughs> good question so of course people want predictability so I'd imagine that judges would have to have maybe and they'd all have different ones. They might have to post publicly on their website, like their standards for evidence rules, damages, procedures, you know, testimony, cross-examination. Maybe every court case they ever heard was video recorded and posted on their website. So you could go look through them and see like, okay, what kind of, how's this judge feel about this? Is he being fair here? Is he being impartial? And that would have a good way for people to vet judges. And obviously it's too much for one person to go through thousands and hours of testimony. So maybe there could be an entrepreneurial um, possibility there for somebody to come up with a service saying, Hey, we compiled all these you know, hours of testimony. We look through them and we've given a synopsis on how each judge acts and how they rule and give them a rating on how fair they are and how impartial they are and mm-hmm. so on and so forth. 
Oh yeah, so, that's, that's pretty awesome. It, it, so basically, again, I mean, you're looking at market forces, market powers, and you know the market forces of incentive and constraint uh, to guide human behavior that will create the things that we essentially want. And whether it's you know whether it's we're talking about judges or we're talking about uh, you know access to things like hey a Yelp review for judges like who's going to make that? Oh well, hey if someone if someone if there's money involved then you know, it'll, it'll get created. And we see that in our daily life all the time today. You know, there's stuff that people are seeking in order to profit. They're creating things that they think people will want. There are things that people want that people are dying to create, uh, like renewable energies, for example, who, you know, yeah. people are investing money so they can capitalize on it. And so you're really, really using this idea of, uh, of the market forces to create these things as opposed to like it being something that, uh, is, I guess, uh, is controlled by government who, as we all agree, uses resources terribly uh, inefficiently. Right. Hat picks favorites, picks winners and losers. And I think it's a mistake. I think, uh, you know, like a lot of like right wingers, especially free market types, um, they'll, they'll, they'll understand that like the, mar- the free market is best for making tennis shoes or swimming pools or something like that. But when it comes to things like police and courts and the military, I think they tend to have this visceral reaction a lot of times I get from people that they they just they they are convinced there is no way possible that anybody but the government can handle that but I always try to ask people like if, okay you know if the market's good enough for things that are useful but not super important then you know wouldn't it be better for things that are super important but we don't typically think that as their natural role and I think one thing is that there's no you know justice like like Legal services is no different than – there's nothing fundamentally different about that than there is from tennis shoes or basketballs or, or what any other kind of product or service out there. There's nothing fundamentally different about uh, military defense than there is about massage therapy that makes it so you can't have the market provide one and, and not the other. And to tie this all together, I'd like to give you like a little example of how this system might work. In sure. Theory. Absolutely. And I figured maybe we could close on this. Yeah, perfect. So, Okay, so we got our free society, right? No government. Mm-hmm. We're all happy. Everything's great. Oh, actually, you know what? Before I start this, there was one last thing I wanted to say. Sure. Go for so, it. So I do think this free society would actually be far less violent than our society today. I think that peaceful conflict resolution would probably become the norm. And, I, you know, also because, like, the societal level of coercion, force, violence, and such by the state would be gone. Because... The thing is, whether you think taxation is necessary, we all have to we all have to agree that it is money extracted by coercion, by threat of force. Absolutely. Even political scientists, which tend to be very pro government, that's what they that's their definition. And the same thing with the government itself. Government is a monopoly on the use of force and violence in a given territorial area. That is what it is. Absolutely. So, whether you think it's necessary or not is is kind of beside the point. That's the fact. The matter is. That's what it is. And when you don't have that in society, I think that makes there's some huge effects there because people left and right, especially today, have this kind of paternalistic or maternalistic view of the state. Like the, the, a lot of right wingers, they'll have this real they want law and order. They want they want the state to be the disciplinarian, the authoritarian, like like the father. And then a lot of left wingers want that, you know, to, they want the softer, kinder state. They want to that will take care of you the, the you know, kind of the welfare state <laughs> but they also want to make sure that you don't stick your fingers in the electric sockets so you have the nanny state the regulatory state so of course daddy or mommy is a role model for <laughs> kids and people growing up today yeah. they might see daddy use force to make people comply with what he wants them to do to solve disputes you know to, to how you might see how daddy treats people who think differently than he does with violence and i don't think that's good for society honestly i think that has a lot more effects than we think about i think you're absolutely right on that i in the way you know their your metaphors and you're you know using the visualization and even even the words like i never even connected like oh the the, the nanny state you know the mother state the father state <laughs> these are fantastic metaphors that make a lot of sense to me actually well i wish i could take credit for them but i can't remember who said them first well, nanny right. state, I know, has been around forever, but I mean, I never conceptualized it as like, oh, like an actual physical being. But I mean, that's essentially what it is. I mean, it's it's yeah. coddling you and protecting you and don't do this, don't do that to the point right. of, uh, I mean, to our detriment, I would say. Yeah, I, I think so, too. And you hear like you'll hear lefties talk about like government's the referee in the game, like they'll pers- 
literally. Mm-hmm. And it's that's yeah, man. So that's kind of the same type of thing there. <laughs> yeah, it's it's that's pretty wild. So what was uh, uh, what was your final thought? Was that or is that your side thought? And now you want to get to yes, your final that's point? It. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to give you an example of how this thing might work. Sure. So we're in our free society. Private. We have private police. We have private government. We have all these different things. And yes, it's possible. I'm, I might subscribe to a private police agency that will make sure I get my property recovered. They'll do patrols in my neighborhood to make sure that you know there's nothing that we creep around. But that even if I don't do that, I can still take advantage of the system right here. So let's say I'm out on a run. I'm at, you know, at the park and I'm, I'm, I'm jogging on my way home now and I'm on my road and I see my car drive past me with some dude in it. <laughs> so I spin around, right? I say, that's my car. And I start sprinting off in the direction. And then mm-hmm. I see my car pull off onto another road that leads into this kind of cul-de-sac, this neighborhood. So I sit and I think, and I realize like, Hey, that looks like Jeff. I hate Jeff. He's such a jerk. I knew it was him because him and I have had problems for a long time. So I go down to Jeff's house, right? I'm mad. I knock on his door. And I say, hey, dude, you stole my car. I just saw you driving it down the road. And he says, uh-uh, you're crazy. Screw off. Get out of here. <laughs> Slams the door in my face. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of standing there like, all right. So I go out back and I look in the garage window because I don't see it outside. And mm-hmm. I can see through the garage window, which is real dirty and dusty, I can see what looks like my car. But I really can't prove it because I can't see the VIN number on it. And I go back, knock on his door. I was like, dude, open the garage. I want to look in there right now. And he's like, no, dude, dude get out of my, get off my property. So we have a dispute we can't resolve. Mm-hmm. And while you could say that I had the moral right to use force to get my car back, if I was 100% sure that was my car, mm-hmm. which I would have that moral right, that's probably not the best way to go about things. Because that probably wouldn't be looked on in a good light. My neighbors would probably be weirded out. They might not want to interact with me. They'd be like, dude, you know, you probably didn't have to go you know, do that, man. A neighborhood's not going to like people unilaterally resolving disputes of violence. You know, they don't want to live mm-hmm. in a neighborhood where there's bullets flying, there's fights in the street, there's high-speed car chases. Nobody wants to deal with that. Mm-hmm. Hey, you know, and my employer, they might find out about this whole altercation. And they say, hey, I heard you kicked in Jeff's door and beat the crap off, beat the brakes off him. You know, mm-hmm. like, what's up with that, man? Like, I'm, I'm not sure I want your unstable ass to work here after you're going to act like that. So people would probably be incentivized to just be cool and work the system. So instead, I would have a private security agency handle that for me. And they'd have like a bunch of real big, intimidating dudes, you know, sleeve tattoos, beards. Um, tribal tattoos, of course, all over the place. Very intimidating. Um, maybe, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe they might have defensive gear, right? They might have some pretty heavy body armor. Mm-hmm. Might have like those Lexan riot shields and whatnot to protect them from attacks. Um, so that way they don't have to be so. Because part of the reason that cops have to shoot first and ask questions never or later <laughs> is because the fact of the matter is, like, they can't wait for somebody to shoot at them to start shooting because. They might get shot. But if you have like some actual defensive gear, like somebody could throw, you could let somebody throw some rocks at you or hit you with a baseball bat and shrug it off. So, and this is going somewhere here in a second. But this okay. group would also have like uh, less lethal weapons, you know, far past what we have because I think there'd be a bigger market for less lethal technologies, uh, which I'll also explain here in a second. Mm-hmm. So, what they wouldn't do, this private security company, they wouldn't just be like, okay, you're our customer. You give us a pile of money. We'll take your word for it. We'll go down there, kill Jeff, and get your team, get your car back. That's not probably how they work. They wouldn't just blow the door off the hinges with a breaching charge, you know, run in, shoot the dog, shoot Jeff, shoot his wife and kids, etc. Yeah, that would be yeah. totally reckless, totally unnecessary, and obviously would be a far greater proportion of force than what the situation calls for. And it's also be bad for business. Because there's no monopoly coercive funding of the security service, People would be free to choose other agencies, and nobody would want to use an agency that routinely killed people or used disproportionate force because, number one, most people are appalled by that type of thing. And it also creates other problems uh, such as financial liability for the user of the service and also for the service itself because now you're financially liable in court for the death of the victim. And also, hey, the guy you killed, his family might go get a bunch of guns and want to come kill you. And who wants those problems? So, therefore, before they agree to go get my car back, they got to see something more. They say, hey, man, I'm sorry. I know we know you real well, but we can't take your word for it. So I say, okay, I'm going to have to go get an opinion from a reputable judge 
saying that I have a claim on this car. So I've already argued with the neighbor, right? He says, I, mean, I go down there, right? And I'm like, hey, man, look, I'm, you know, I want to work this out, right? Yes, but I know that's my car. So, like, you know, give me my car back. And he says, no, it's not your car. And I say, okay, well, prove it's not my car. Let me come in and take a look at the VIN number. He says, no. So I challenge him. And, of course, all the neighbors know about this type of thing. Mm-hmm. And I say, okay, here's a list of 40 judges within 50 miles who hear these type of cases. They're experts on property crimes. So you pick one. We take it to him, and I agree with whatever that opinion is. We'll leave it at that. And, you know, I might, I might agree, happen to agree to do this because I have security camera footage. I have the VIN number of my car. I can match up with the VIN plate on the car, so on and so forth. And because, this, because I have this strong case, maybe he refused. Maybe he says, uh, yeah, dude, I'm not doing this. Get out of my property. See you later. And, of course, the neighbors that are watching and listening to this because everybody loves drama in the neighborhood, mm-hmm. they might say, oh, that's very sketchy. Um, maybe I don't want to deal with Jeff anymore if he's not willing to agree to do this arbitration because what would he possibly have to hide? So that's one way to kind of enforce people, to encourage people to use the system. But it really doesn't matter. That's really – I mean, I – I get what you're saying. I get the point and everything. It's just my only concern is that it, it's a lot of what ifs. It's like, of yeah, course. this would work. And like, you know, and I, and it, it's just, it's really tough because especially like in an anarchic society, I mean, people have all the choices. Like everything is available to them. No more restrictions. They can do anything they want. And it's like, there's this infinite amount of possibilities. So it's really, I mean, like, I think it's really difficult in your position to really to even to try to even explain it because there's so many different possibilities. Like, I mean, I was just thinking, yes. I'm thinking to myself, you know, if you show up to this guy's front door with a security force, that's just not, who's to say he doesn't already have his own security force. And what, how do they interact? How's that going to go down? What if, well, uh, you know, like in the neighbors, they have security forces. What if they see the car coming in and another guy just I mean, it's it's like, right. it's so it's it's really complicated. And I, I yes. don't I can't really I can't fully wrap my head around it. And I think that hey. because of that, especially because I can't conceptualize it, I think like if we were to ever even attempt this, I think there'd be a lot of chaos. It sounds to me like there'd be a lot of trying to figure things out and, and, and if, it'd be tough. But go ahead. If we did it today, certainly. But keep in mind, we don't get to this free society until most people kind of think the way I do about property rights and natural rights. Oof. So that's, of course, that, keep in mind, that is a precursor for that, society. Yes, yeah. And most, a lot of this, of course, it is an ideal. And you might, people might say it's utopian, but of course, then thinking that you can have a government that stays small is, I think, also utopian. As, <laughs> it's as just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is, like, like you said in the beginning, like we're all on this liberty train, man. I just want to take it all the way to the end of the line. But hey, anytime that train's moving, I'm... I'm I'm happy with that. But so let me say this too is that as far as like you know, there are so many rabbit trails you can go down, but as far as security forces go, so yeah, the neighbor has a security force. Number one, I wouldn't show up to his house with the security force in the first place because that's mm-hmm. just provoking things for no reason. Number two, if he does have his own security force, they're gonna probably say, Well, hey man, like he says you stole his car, like why don't you go get this sorted out? Because they don't have any interest in having a reputation as somebody that protects criminals because then they're just a bunch of gang enforcers. So, and who knows, maybe for the contract for your security force, they say if somebody asks you to go to private arbitration or to a judge, you have to go. Otherwise, we're going to kick you off our policy or something like that. So, um, fair, fair. But, so let's say, okay, so let's say, Jeff, if he agrees to go to the judge with me and we hash our case out, great. Then we go to the judge, we hash it out. If not, I can still take it to a judge, right? And sure. if he doesn't, if he doesn't, and of course he's been given notice that this is happening, right? Like some kind of subpoena system, mm-hmm. but not a legally binding subpoena. So if Jeff doesn't show up, I get to present my case and the judge is probably going to rule in my favor because I have all this evidence. I've got him caught on camera. I've got a low jack that has, that shows my car at his house or whatever. Mm-hmm. So if I rule that, yes, this is my car. I have the right to recover it plus damages. So I take that opinion, which would probably be a piece of paper or something, back to the enforcement or security agency, which could be combined combined operations or separate companies. There's a bunch of different permutations there. And I show them this paper and I say, okay, the judge says, this is my car. Can you guys go get it? They say, yes, sir. So there will be a notice that this ruling was made to Jeff. Like he's going to know about this. Saying that, okay, man, you got one last chance, one last chance to get this car up. Otherwise, I'm sending the goon squad 
So he might decide, okay, you know what? I really don't want to fight all these guys, so I'll give it up. Or he might say, you know what? Screw you, dude. This is my car. He might he might deny it till the end. Mm-hmm. So then the security force my, that I hired, they showed at Jeff's house. And they show up with like 10 dudes all carrying who knows? I mean, they might, some of, one of them might have a lethal weapon or a couple of them, but who knows? They might have pepper ball, paintball launchers. They might have uh, CS gas. They might have stun weapons. They might have some foam that immobilizes people for a half hour or something. They might have those net launchers, you know, <laughs> that shoot nets out of, you know. I mean, yeah, this yeah. guy, but I think really the security force would be far better off if when they leave, Jeff is unharmed. Because that's much better for their business because mm-hmm. they can advertise like, hey, we'll recover our prop- your property without putting your property at jeopardy, meaning that you know we'll recover your property but not like, get you sued in the, in the process. I think that'd be a big selling point for people because nobody wants to deal with all that headache afterwards. So, yeah, absolutely. But, but either way, they show up, they say, hey, dude, uh, let us go get that car from you. And he might realize at this point how screwed he is and he might give it up peacefully or he may not. He may shut the door and go grab a shotgun, but I think the agency uses the least force possible to subdue him or to extract the car because we're not because they're not going after Jeff. I think that they probably just kick the door into the garage and open the door up and drive my car away. Yeah, you could just and, do that if he's sleeping. Just right. take the car in the middle of the night. I mean, again, you know, I, I uh, it's it's hard for me to really conceptualize because there. I mean, you're talking about infinite possibilities. Merging with infinite possibilities, merging with infinite possibilities. It's, for, you know, and for me, it's hard to see with all options on the table how you won't have a dramatic increase in in bad outcomes, given that there's so many possibilities for every single conceivable thought or feeling. Like, you know, if everyone just, you know, and typically, I mean, I think people tend to be more passionate than they are logical. Um, and I think passions drive them to do certain things. So I, I would suggest that. Uh, in a society like that, I think you'd have a lot more of like people getting angry and saying, "Oh, you know, screw you! I'm doing what I want." And it kind of—I think you'd see a little bit more violence, honestly, in an anarchic society with that. Unless, unless you're saying, because I know you're, you know, the precursor to all this you're saying is that people agree on this non-aggression principle. People are already thinking like you are right now. Um, so, and, and I think that in itself, that would even be difficult to do because I mean, just human nature, man, is so. It's so volatile. It's so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not like, it's not one way or the other. It's, it's a bowl of potential. And, you know, it, the bowl is always changing. You know, it's always, you know, I can't even say for myself, like, am I a good or bad person? It's like, well, you know, I've done bad stuff in the past. So I'd say I'm, I've done mostly good stuff, but I can't, I can't definitively say I'm like a good person. You know what I mean? Yes, I understand. But that's just it, though. The map itself is human nature because, you know, we learn in kindergarten. Don't hurt people. Don't take their stuff. And, and parents yourself, essentially. You hear that all, all the time. And that's how we treat people every day. And even when we have to speak, you know, if you have an argument with Donald's cashier, she's giving you an attitude, and you ask for no mayonnaise on your burger, like, you don't jump the counter and start beating the crap out of her. No, you ask for the manager. Or... Have you seen you know, some of those KFC sweet. videos? <laughs> right. <laughs> See, that kind of behavior, it really, it's the minority in our society. And I don't think people act that way because they're afraid of the cops. Because the cops are not a deterrent to anything. People that are going to murder are going to murder. People that are going to do drugs are going to do drugs. You know, drugs have been illegal this whole time, but drug use keeps going. So obviously the, the, the presence of a, a monopoly on force that's enforcing its own set of statutes, I don't think really has as much of an effect as we think it does. But the bottom line is that every person you interact with every day, and this goes for 99.9% of people on the planet, they, you treat each other not violently. Like you find a, po- a peaceful way to resolve disputes and you mm-hmm. respect each other's property, you respect each other's personal space. You don't go around putting your hands on people. That's, 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 I think that's human nature. I think it's human nature for us to cooperate more for, than us, for us to, you know, violently, you know, attack each other because that takes more energy anyway. But the thing is, is that we make this one exception for the non-aggression principle and that's for the government. But other than that, we abide by it. We live it every day. Interesting. So it's really just, we're not as far as from, I think that ideal as we think, because we already act in an anarchic way. The most time, I think it's very few people that go around, you know, saying like, okay, is this thing I do about to do, is it legal or is it not? And, uh, no, we say, is it right or is it wrong? And our, our sense of right and wrong, I think is 
part, yes, part of it is societal values, mores, consciousness, things like that. But I think also, I think a lot of it is kind of innate in our human nature. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know, man. That's a whole other podcast. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. No, human nature is a big one. But uh, awesome. Well, I think uh, unless you have anything else to add to that, I think I'll wrap it up here. I'm good with that. Awesome, man. Well, hey, thank you so much for coming on. It's always a pleasure talking with you. I always learn something new. And uh, we'll do it again. Sure thing, man. Awesome. Thank you. Till next time.